What's up, everybody? It's Conrad from ConradRocks.net. We're going to be talking about night terrors. And the reason why is this is coming up a lot recently. And, um, you know, I've already done lots of lots of posts about this. And uh, and I know you may not know about them. So I got a lot of new followers. A lot of you might not know, but I did. Uh, you can go to my blog, ConradRocks.net, and uh, look for the word Night Terrors in the search. You can search the blog. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. I'm going to go find a place to pray. I'm going to go to the, uh, the forest. But while I'm driving there, I'm going to take you with me. And I'm going to talk about my experience experience and how you can overcome when i was a kid and this is in my this is in my book and i give my book away free every six months or so so you can get it it's i give it away free as an ebook but it's called open your eyes my supernatural journey and i had a terrifying experience which kicked off the succession of terrifying experiences as a child. Hi, Nick Sarah. Hi, Gary Nesbitt. Hi, Jessica. God bless you guys. Anyway, so I was in my room. I was four or five years old. I was in Houston, Texas. Um, and someone came into my room and put their hand over my mouth and my nose. And I was asleep. And one of the things about night terrors is you're fighting to wake up. You're fighting desperately to wake up. And and if you look up the etymology of the word nightmare, it's actually an old English word. It comes from the, the incubus and succubus demons that come and sit on your chest. They sit on your face. They suffocate you. And they have this way of keeping you asleep. And, it, and, and this feels like you're fighting to come from the bottom of the black ocean to come to the surface and you know it's like you're awake but you can't speak right and a lot of the parapsychologists and psychologists will call uh, night tears actually sleep paralysis because you're, you're, you're extremely afraid and you're paralyzed you can't move your body you can't do anything and uh, you're just struggling to wake up and, and this night this man had his hand on my face and I was tr- saying all I could do when I started bubbling to come up to the surface was say, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, into the hand, right? And then as I finally got to wake up, the only thing I could move was my eyelids. I woke up. I was completely paralyzed. A lot of people, a lot of you write me emails. You tell me, hey, I'm paralyzed. I can't do anything except open my eyes and just be completely terrified. That's why it's called a night terror. And um, so then as I opened my eyes, I was five years old. I noticed that it was my hand on my face. I was trying to grab the hand, the assailant's hand with my other arm. And I noticed that I was trying to remove my own hand from my face. So when I realized that, um, when I realized that, it's like, you shall know the truth, the truth will make you free. I'm like, how is this happening? I had some cognitive dissonance when I was a five-year-old. The cognitive dissonance is when you're maintaining two beliefs at the same time, and one of them's got to give. You're confused, right? So I... Uh, I took off the hand, I thought, and I finally had control. I finally had control of that hand. And then I was terrified because the presence was still in the room. Okay, now, I had very many successive attacks for the rest of my life. Uh, Well, for the rest of my childhood, let's put it that way. And I want to talk about... Uh, why this happened and our authority in Jesus and how to get out of it, okay? My dad was a Christian, okay? But he dabbled. He was married to his first wife, and they had dabbled in some occult practices. So what they were trying to do uh, was marry the occult with Christianity. Uh, They would go to some seances, and some guy would give a prophetic word at a seance. I mean, this is completely crazy, but this is the background 
that I grew up in. Okay. Then, um, as I learned more and more about this, my dad would tell me, he, he would do things, uh, he would tell me things about his past. They saw some psychics. Uh, he recorded this stuff, and I'm like, okay, I didn't know any better. I mean, how many Christians nowadays read their horoscope? Do you, you know what I'm saying? So I had um, this in my historical background, and I guess you could call it a generational curse or something like that. You, What happens, the point I'm driving home is this. When Cain slew Abel... Um, that opened a door to sin. And God says, you know, sin lies at the door. His desire is for you, and you must rule over him. Sin is looking to still kill and destroy you. And we've got to shut the door to sin. Uh, to, to, to giving the portal. Sin's how the demon gets in through the portal and messes with you. And I'm, I'm going to tell you what. There are things, it's, it's kind of like we give the demon permission to come in. And mess with us. That's one caveat of this being able to overcome night terrors is we give the demon permission. We've got Ouija boards. I mean, these are the obvious things. Um, <clears throat> these are the obvious things. Ouija boards, new age practices, new age books, tarot cards, uh, seances, uh, seeing psychics, things like that uh, where God is clearly displeased with Cool, Jessica. Uh, delivered in authority. We're going to talk about deliverance and authority. But these are demons that pretty much, uh, they're not inside you so much as they harass you. Okay? I wanted to, to make that point. So we can have these things in our house that just basically are a door to having the demon come in. Now... Throughout my throughout my childhood, I had lots of demonic attacks. I mean, it just kept on going. I was terrified. But now that I've been through all of that, I can tell you that there is victory in Jesus. And the thing is, twofold. And I talked to Nick Sayre yesterday uh, on a Facebook Live. He, he realized that once he had deliverance, then he was basically on a witch hunt <laughs> to get the pigs out of the parlor. There's a book called Pigs in the Parlor. And, and basically it highlights having the devoted things in your house that give access to your family. Now, the devoted thing comes from a book of Joshua. I think it's somewhere around, I forget the chapter, but it's where Joshua goes in to, to possess the promise. We as Christians are to carry out the prophetic word that Moses was delivering. You're going to go to the promised land. You're going to go to the promised land. Then here comes Joshua, the next generation. The candle is handed to him. The mantle is handed to him to actually possess the promise, to go take back, to go take the territory that was the enemies, right? During that time where he goes into Jericho, God tells him to say, hey, look, do not take any of the accursed things into your house or lest you will become accursed like it, right? So the guy, uh, when they when they take Jericho, I'm going to tell you how cool this is. They take Jericho and then they go out to fight this little battle and, oh, we just need a few people. And they were smitten. The whole, the whole nation of Israel fled before a small enemy because one of the guys took some gold he took a Babylonian garment, he put it in his house, and all the whole congregation was powerless. You cannot walk in power if you have things devoted to destruction in your life. You want power in your life? Get rid of the junk God doesn't want you to have in your house. You know, I'm going to tell you that that's very, very important. So once he got rid of that, once they purged that iniquity, uh, Moses talks about burning these things with fire. You know, a lot of people say, well, I want to throw away these things. If you're walking in that level of knowledge, I believe God will honor that. Like if you have occult CDs or heavy metal music, stuff like that, and you don't know that you're supposed to burn it, but you throw it away, I've had people say, well, that's that I've walked in victory there, and they didn't realize that you're supposed to burn those things. And... Um, Anyway, when you burn those things, like I'm going to tell you one time I had a, 
a, a, a mm-hmm. deliverance party. I was actually leading worship for this church, and some very prophetic people came in and said, look, Conrad, you can't listen to heavy metal and lead worship. There's spirits involved. And I, I'm going to tell you what, the God of this world blinds mm-hmm. the minds of those that don't believe, okay? The God of this world will, will keep you from seeing the scriptures about the devoted things. He will give you an occluded thing because what you're doing is you're choosing to believe. My people perish for lack of knowledge, Hosea 4, 6. Because I has rejected knowledge, what happens, the Bible lays out, lays out what we're supposed to do. It's there. A lot of us willing are willing to stay in our ignorance, and the, the God of this world blinds the minds. Okay? So, I didn't see the scriptures about the devoted things. I didn't see it. I didn't believe it. And then after a while, I said, you know, my friends here, they're, they're very sincere, and they walk in the Mark 16 signs of a believer. Mark 16, Jesus says, these are the signs that are going to follow them that believe. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to borrow their faith. I'm going to believe what they're saying. Amen, Nick. So I went out and I had a burn party, like they had an axe. If you remember, they got saved an axe. They burned their occult books. So I burned that. And as I was burning these heavy metal and secular CDs, uh, these bats and fowls of the air, the black demons that have wings or, you know, they look like crows, they were spiraling upwards. And I got real dizzy. I got real dizzy because I was accursed like it. Okay, you would like in, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy twenty seven twenty eight somewhere around there the blessings and the curses you'll be a curse like it and Joshua when they take Jericho God is telling them like don't take it in here you'll be a curse like it so when I was experiencing deliverance I actually got dizzy because these things by faith these things I burned them and they left me and I felt fifty pounds lighter in the spirit so that was deliverance and I found out you know what. I need to get these things out of my house. And there are many things in our houses that we think are okay. And God has more power. I understand. But why, why have unnecessary warfare? Why not be sanctified? Why not be holy so we can walk in the power that God wants us to be? Now, I'm going to tell you what. A lot of us want to hold on to our our idols and so forth because they're fun. I'm going to tell you what, it's a lot more fun to see somebody you prayed for get delivered, to see somebody you pray for get uh, healed. And I'm going to tell you, there, the um, the Bible talks about husbands loving your wives, something, I forget the scripture right now, but it says that your prayers be not hindered. Why walk in hindered prayers? Let's walk in victory. Let's get rid of those things. So now... Um, you get deliverance, you get rid of the things out of your house, then you got your generational curses, that's what I had to deal with. Um, I had to deal with, you know, the fact that my dad and my mom, they went to science, uh, seances, scientists, <laughs> they went to seances, uh, they did uh, psychics, I did them too, I walked in the new age for quite some time, and however, I still had uh, these attacks. Now, once... I realized that I had authority. Then the tables turned on these things. All right? The tables turned. And I realized that I could cast it out. I could tell it to leave. But I had to know you will be tested. You don't know that you have faith until it's tested. Amen. The church does need this uh, teaching, Diane. It's... You know, they basically ignore it. Um, they basically ignore that. So, But anyway, you do not know that you have faith until it's actually tested. So once these things happen um, and it comes back to bother you, and I'm going to tell you why, a lot of you listening to this right now have had experience with this. And I'm going to say the people that send me the emails, the people that send me the messages, they're ashamed to talk about these things happening, and I'm, I'm being a little bit brave because I don't care what I look like. I realize that that my experience in this can help other people. And I want to tell you, get this stuff out of your room. And then another thing that I find interesting is a lot of people want prayer from somebody else, like some magical guy is going to... uh, That came out wrong. A lot of people are looking for pastors and other people to pray for them for deliverance in this area. 
when they need to walk in the victory for themselves, okay, just because you have a pastor or somebody else pray for you and you don't want to get rid of your demonic stuff in your house, well, I mean, you know, we need to repent. You can't just live in sin. I mean, you got you got to you got to get rid of the offensive thing that's giving permission um, to the devil. You know, Jesus talks about the strong man. You know, you got to get rid of the strong man that's in your house. Or seven worse are going to come. You know, once you get delivered, seven worse are going to come. So once you get rid of that strong man out of your house, the d- demonic strong man has been beating you up. You know, you seek the Lord, Second Timothy chapter 2. You, he grants you repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. When you know the truth, that, that truth will make you free. Like, hey, man, this thing is in here. I, it's offensive to God. I need to get rid of it. This isn't a popular teaching because a lot of people love to stay in their sin. And, I, I, you know, I'm not trying to upset you, but I'm just trying to help you. So then, then you will be attacked later. Now, just because, just because I got deliverance doesn't mean it's over. I mean, it, w- what will happen? The devil left Jesus. You know, Jesus told the devil to leave. And what does it say in Matthew 4 and Luke 4? He waited for an opportune time to come back. Right? And then he starts, once he can't mess with you anymore, he messes with people that can mess with you. Okay? So the devil was attempting uh, attack, tempting Jesus head on in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Then after that, you know, wow, he can't, he can't mess with Jesus. Right? So he messes with the religious system to try to kill Jesus. Right? Even, you know, even Paul did that. Um. All right, so where did I want to go next? I want to, oh, yeah. Yeah, after that, after I got the deliverance and so forth, you know, I thought I was free, and I was free. I was completely free. But there comes these times that it'll come back. And then you need to, just like that strong man, you know, you bind him, you get rid of him. You can't have a clean, swept house. you got to put the Word of God in that house. Because the demon, he goes around to the dry places and he goes, you know what? I need to go back to my house from which I came from. And then he takes seven of his friends. Now, the seven of his friends uh, goes back. You know, we think of the New Testament. If you read the Old Testament, God says, if you do not f- repent from all this, I will punish you seven times more. And that's where the word seven comes from. It's going to be seven times worse. So once you once you definitely get delivered from that, you need to put the word of God in you and shut the door. You just like when Cain slew Abel, he said, you know, his desire is for you. you he lies at the door. His desire is for you and you must rule over him. You rule over him by shutting the door and not doing that anymore. And then when they do come back to attack you, I'm going to tell you what, it's not scary anymore. It's kind of like, oh, there you are again. It's no longer a night terror. It's like, oh, man, I got to tell it to go. And I've had that encounter just a few times uh, since my my deliverance, and I, I just wanted to, to share that with you. I want to share with you another story um, about deliverance and victory before I let you go on this one. There's a guy named Lester Summerall, and, and a lot of people are getting attacked by night terrors right now, and that's the reason I'm talking about this. I'm getting a lot of messages, and I'm just going to kind of like shotgun a, a, a bunch of my thoughts while I'm driving to go to, on my prayer walk. Um, Lester Summerall was a protege of a man, I forget his name, but he met Smith Wigglesworth. Smith Wigglesworth is a man that read the Bible only, right? And he laid his hands on Lester Summerall back in, I think, probably the 40s, around the time of World War II. Lester Summerall, uh, went to the, God called him to the Philippines through an open vision. He went to the Philippines and... At this time, he was going to build a massive church for God in the Philippines. I'm going to tell you this really cool story. There was a demon-possessed prostitute. They didn't know what to do with her. She, They put her in a prison in Manila. And the warden of the prison, it was so bad, she would curse people and they would die. She was doing demonic manifestations like like uh, biting bruises. <laughs> she would scream and talk in another language, a language of a man. And um, so it got so bad that the warden of the prison 
appealed on radio for help. Now, there was a Catholic exorcist that was sent to her, and uh, he tried to exorcise her, and she cursed him to die in three days, and he died in three days. Somebody else died in three days, right? And God is talking to Lester Summerall as he hears about this, and he says, I want you to take care of that. Lester Summerall said, no, I, I'm not going to take care of this. Uh, I'm here to build you a church, you know, send somebody else. So the appeal goes on two or three times with the Lord. He was arguing with the Lord. And the Lord said something to Lester Summerall. He said, I have nobody but you in the Philippines to do this. I want you to think about that. Think about it. He said, you're the guy. You're the only guy that can do this. So Lester Summerall, he went over there. And he battled. You know, he, they, they were afraid to have an American try and cast out a devil. Yeah, because, you know, back then being an American was a big deal. You know, you, you go to a foreign country um, and you die. <laughs> you, you'd be in trouble with the government type thing. So he said, look, just let me do this. So Lester Summerall confronts this demon. And you know what? The demon didn't kill him, but he also didn't cast it out. Okay, so here's something else. Lester Summerall is the only man in the country. The first time he went over there, he couldn't cast it out, and he says, okay, I got to fast and prayer three days. Jesus says, this kind comes not out but by prayer and fasting. The bigger the level, the bigger the devil. This was a large principality, and the Lord showed Lester Summerall that this was a principality demon over the country of Manila, or the Philippines, in the city of Manila, that was manifesting itself through this little girl. And once you break that principality, once you, you're called to do that, God called him to do it. He wasn't a Christian cowboy and went to do it on his own accord. He was called. God gave him the authority. However, he didn't fast and pray. So then he fasts and prays for three days. The girl cursed him. He never died. He comes back. He casts out the demon out of the girl. Okay, now this is documented. You can look this up. Okay, so in the I think it was in the 50s. I'm doing this from memory. So hopefully everything's right. The mayor of the city of Manila, uh, I, I think I heard all this from God's generals on Roberts Learden on YouTube. Just Roberts Learden. Look up uh, uh, Lester Summerall if you want to verify what I'm saying here. This is where I got it. And I read it other places, too. So he tells the mayor of Manila um, The mayor of Manila says, hey, what can I do for you? You know, you've, you've given us a great deliverance. He says, well, give me, give me this tent or this meeting place, something like that, for about six weeks, and I'm going to have this girl testify, and we're going to win a lot of people to the Lord. Well, what happened was this principality was cast out, the power over that city was broken, and thousands upon thousands of people got saved because of that. All right? So the, the moral of the story is this. We've got relationship. Lester all. Lester Summerall had a relationship with the Lord. We've got that he was authorized. He, he, he had the authority to cast out de that demon. Well, I'm going to tell you what. These, that was a principality. Okay, We wrestle not with flesh and blood, with principalities and powers. Jesus says, you shall cast out demons. These night terrors are not principalities. They are demons. We have the authority in Jesus Christ to cast them out. You need to know that, and you just need to do it. Amen? <laughs> you, you can do it. Get rid of the offensive thing in your house. Ask God what it is. And uh, it could be, it might blow your mind. It might blow your theology, guys. It really, it really might. But you need that relationship with the Spirit. Then once you know you have that authority, it's not suspecting you have the authority. You know you have the authority. You confront it and you tell it to leave. Amen? All right, guys, there you go. The only reason I'm talking about this, a lot of people are getting hit with the night terror thing. If you look up the etymology of the word, it comes from an old English word. It talks about the incubus and succubus spirits uh, that try to suffocate you. This has been going on for thousands of years. There's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. This is how it works. God bless you. If this has touched you, please share this on social media. Also, you know, you can look up my Night Terrors uh, podcast. It's somewhere on conradrocks.net. I talk about it a lot because, you know, I dealt with this. Love you guys. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher.